we're going to talk about something that becomes a principle in the Bible in the New Testament today. Um, there's going to be questions from me. There can be questions from you. We're going to look for realizations. In other words, oh, I get that now. So I'll describe it to you and then uh, we'll look at what this means. Today's not about scripture as much as it's about discerning the unspoken lesson or the unspoken information that is in this action we're going to talk about today. Now, during the time that Jesus ministered, who was in charge of that ministry and led it? Father. Okay, looking at the Creator, yep. looking at uh, the creation and the next chain of authority and duty below that was Jesus. Now, did Jesus know and choose where He should go, where He should be, who He should visit with? Sometimes? But I think more than that, he, he, uh, he did what God told Him to do. He did what God told Him to do. Diane, did you have a thought or did we cover it? Covered that. Okay. When we think of the physical nature of ministry, of caring for people, uh, ministering to them in their time of need, it's pretty clear Jesus was doing that work. He did it with the woman at the well obviously a very intentional encounter. The woman brought before him that was caught by the city fathers and brought to him. That whole experience, again, Jesus was the one interacting. As we move towards the disciples and look at their job while Jesus was leading the charge on giving these men training and experience and instruction. As everything was moving towards that, do you think Jesus was potentially thinking about his departure and what would happen after he left? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he was thinking about that. That's evident in how he teaches them uh, the time when he says, um, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and we know the rest of that story. Let's think of Jesus and his leadership, his job, his uh, experiences interacting with people. Let's think of them in terms of Jesus' hands and Jesus' heart working. Now, when Jesus was taken and crucified, what happened to the ministry model that was in existence that Jesus had put in place? Uh, momentarily, it stopped. Momentarily, it stopped. Diane, would you say that's a good description or there might be another description? Pastor Bill, do you think it actually stopped at that moment where Jesus was taken and the ministry halted? No, it never stops. Nancy? They, they all thought it had stopped. Yeah. They thought it had stopped, Dave. Well, he told them to wait until they got the Holy Spirit. Then they would have the power to do it. Now, during that time that they were waiting... Did they sit idle on their hands? No. There was a whole bunch of discussion, lots of questions. Yeah. What happened about this? Well, who do you think was responsible for that? I wish we could have intervened. There was a variation in the course Jesus' ministry was on. But like Pastor Bill said, I don't think it came to a halt I think for lack of clear understanding, I think the disciples did what Jesus said and they waited at this point. But in the stories, we, we think of 
uh, the supper in the room, when we think of their times discussing and uh, visiting about Jesus, about their calling, the ministry, the mission they're on, their minds were going all the time. Now think in the physical context of the work of being a missionary. What thing changed and became something new when Jesus was raised and he ascended and he was gone? There was a huge dynamic change within the disciples. It became about Jesus preaching Jesus. Preaching his capital H story. Yeah, right. Do you think anybody noticed that they went from the one leader to who's leading? Do you think they talked about that? Do you think they felt they understood how to function and go forward? Well, they were used to the Jewish law that was very rigidly structured, so that wasn't quite as clear, I would think, when they first started out. You think they might have had a little bit of uh, second guessing and uh, possibly some frustration in figuring that out? We know at one point they argued over who was going to be in charge and who got this and who got that. The point that I'm aiming at is very simple, and it is this. Jesus, who represents God the Creator, He represents His title, His authority, His king and kingdom status, and He represents the Holy Spirit. That is all there through Jesus, and now Jesus is gone, and here's these guys standing there, 11 people, and suddenly it goes from the I or the him of Jesus and it goes to they, them, the disciples. It moves to mission work. It moves to Christian living in the context of more than one. Now the primary leader is gone but he has left spirit to lead them and guide them. He's left his instructions, and they understand the purpose of mankind from what they learned in the Old Testament. Another point that we're looking at here is the jobs they had to do, the teaching, the leading, the equipping, became driven by what? Instead of the who of Jesus, what did all the disciples' work and tasks become driven by? It was no longer Him with a capital H. It was the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit. The point again, very intentional. It became what we think of as a team of disciples carrying out the Word of God preaching the story of their master who was no longer by their side, it became about the team, the mentality of the community of believers. It became about being able to acknowledge each other. Think of how frustrating that might have been in some moments. To not have an answer and have a clear definition of, well, you do that, you do that, and he'll do that, and this person's going to do this over here. To not have that. Jesus appointed people to go do things a lot of the time. If we consider the leadership and the doing under this new model after Jesus dies and is not there with them, the team-based tasks they took on, the interacting. It went to a new level and it became more unified and it became more structured. Now, 
we know God is about structure, even chaotic structure. We think about the universe, its creation, its ever-expanding uh, life as the universe grows. And Jesus departs. He's not with them anymore. And now they're thinking, okay, he gave us this instruction and that instruction. And how did accountability function, do you imagine, in the disciples after Jesus was gone, how do you think they dealt with accountability to each other? They probably had meetings to discuss what everyone was doing. They were pretty conscientious about what was being taught and it was being about it being correct. And so if they knew it was taught by the master and they knew it was correct, they were going to abide by it. No question. Dave, you had a thought? Uh, I, I did, but I forgot. I'll if it's As it goes by, I'll grab it for you. <laughs> we go all the way forward in time to Paul's time. In Paul's time, when he was with the men that were being sent out, there were a couple of instances where there was some disagreement. There was some questioning. There was some correction and chastising but it still remained the we in the New Testament things come down to the us, we and when looking at it in others the they model we think of that they model now following what Jesus had put in place but when it comes to our earthly existence our physical life are sharing the gospel with others. How we do church, the way we interact with people and relate to them. I was challenged for years with a problem. I kept forgetting that it is not my or I. And it took me three, four years to master the fact that is an incorrect statement and in that I must refer to things as new hopes or Christs. I had to refer to our family here, the we part of that equation. And in doing that, that leads us to the next question here. When we talk about our congregation, who is the defined leader of our congregation? God. Yeah, Christ. Jesus. Jesus. Uh, Nancy is right. It also includes God. It includes the Holy Spirit. Right. Now, who is ultimately accountable for the capital C church? Joseph who's the Potter. head of the church? No, who's the head of the church biblically? Oh, Jesus. Jesus is. Yeah. Now, Nancy got it right. Joe Takach has his responsibility and he answers to Jesus for everything. When we look at headquarters, is it him, Joe, or is it them, headquarters? Oh, it's them. We think of them. Now, the whole reason we're talking about this is very basic. Who could have guessed that Larry would pass away in Tacoma, that we would inherit them and assimilate them under our umbrella and care for them? That was a surprise that came, a surprise that came out of left field and just shocked me. I was not ready for that at any level. But yet... I find myself realizing that what we are now doing as a congregation is from, and it's about the us, the we family. It's about the group of us. Now, said another way, it's about the team. When Jesus departed, his team continued to function. Paul developed teams and took 
one team apart and rearrange things. But it's about team. Now, I'm going to pick on Diane for a moment here because she has a really good example of what I'm going to point out here. When Diane got a promotion, she became the I person in her work department. It's my job. I'll get you that information. That's my responsibility. I'm the one accountable when it comes to this. It became Diane. Now, when we look at Diane's job under real world situations, Diane has a team. And she has other people that she leads and she directs. Can we think of and acknowledge that sometimes we become hung up on I or we and it should really about be about us? Not the, the me, not the I. It should be about us and about team. What happens when you have team dynamics and you take the I or the me out of the team dynamics and you take the I or me or he out of leadership. You get more coordination and a better working environment. If what? If the people are willing to follow the Holy Spirit. And that's my thought earlier, is that the Holy Spirit actually coordinates a lot of this. Do people have a responsibility to also actively participate and seek and want to work within that? Yes. So, when we remove a single individual as the he leads, with a capital H, he or him, when we take that out of there and we have a group of people that are leading and functioning as a team, what happens when there is a concern? or there might be an issue if the team is what's leading the charge or the group of people. The, the, team, the team works together to find a solution. Nancy, yes? Every team has a leader and so the leader has to be called on to make the final decision if, if for any reason the team doesn't agree. Yeah. Wow. Um, that was awesome because that was where we were going to talk next. Our denomination is moving into a new idea of functionality within uh, congregations and leadership. You know, we used to think those of us who have experiences from Worldwide Church of God and GCI a few years back of senior pastor, other pastors, elders, and the deacons of the church. When you have team model, you have all the people down here, you have the team here, and then you have the person who is the, um, I don't want to say moderator, they are the functional guide. Now you remember when we sat down with Randall and we talked about do we want to continue? If we do, how would that work? Randall became a mentor and a guide, a counselor and a coach for us. But who did he build? Who did he help to coalesce into something that was more than one person that became a team? It was all of us. The New Testament has a lot of examples of team building and team function. And when you look at GCI and where GCI is going, one of the things that is being discussed is that when you take one individual out of authority and you put a team, now what is a team? How many is a team? I would think more than two. When you have a team, you remove the he said, she said, I said, he said. You remove those direct linkages to accuse or to hold somebody else accountable. 
If you have team leadership, Paul lived in that, the disciples after Jesus died within that, the team led. What does it do when a conflict arises? What does it bring to the table that was not there before? More opportunity for conflict. For One sure. might think so, and I would say, I've seen that happen. But when you have a team that is dynamic, that sets policy, that sets direction, that sets the example, if something doesn't pan out and you go back to the team, you're adding an individual who has a concern or a need to the team to resolve an issue or to change a policy. And it becomes nearly impossible to put your sights on one individual and generate an argument. Have you ever experienced being at a family reunion or a family get-together day and mom and dad, grandma, brothers and sisters are all sitting there and everybody's having a good time, but you notice that nobody wants to start a fight, nobody's going near there because grandma's cane will come out from under the table and get your attention. My grandma was like that. When we were together as a bunch of cousins, we did not misbehave because we all answered to each other. As we were brought up, you're your brother's keeper. Keep him out of trouble, protect him. You protect your sister. You protect your brother. You protect Rip. As the team model of playing and leadership went for me when I was a kid, it came down to the fact that there was always a decision do we want to hop on the freight train and ride it all the way out to the rock quarry and then if we catch the train coming home it'll be dark when we get home are we willing to do that and accept our punishment all the kids would look at each other and i'd think uh oh we're going to wind up going sure enough everybody would choose to go and when we got back and we got in trouble the thing we remembered was the trouble was always less severe when it was the group because everybody encouraged everybody else. Everybody brought everybody else back to a central point. This is where we talked, what we talked about. This is what we chose to do. And remember, we chose our consequences. We chose our punishment. This is why gangs get away with stuff. Mm -hmm. But yet, in the ministry model, in the New Testament, the leadership of one became the leadership of several. It became a team functioning uh, environment. Now, anytime we look at uh, models, uh, metaphors, anything like that, they break down at some point. But the idea of team removes an individual to an individual conflict. And if the team sits and agrees on something, and then enacts it, if something goes wrong, the individual who dealt with that thing going wrong goes back to the team. And the team says, well, yeah, we talked about that. Our notes said this. How did you wind up in that situation? The whole point of talking about this today is that Jesus went from a singular leadership model of the, the Godhead, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, leading and ministering through Jesus to the same leadership through the disciples with an S, more than one. And the team-based operations of the church. What is one of the first big benefits when you have team? Cover more territory faster. When they were spreading the gospel and there were three people available to go, two went here, the lone third man was appointed somebody else to go and they went out together and they went to another place and they spread the gospel. 
Can you think of very many times that there was only one person sent to go minister to people in Paul's time? Almost all the examples are about more than one person going. So my question is this. Is there a good benefit? Is there a good experience? Is there a blessing we have not brought into being because we're not totally and efficiently functioning as a team? Is there things that we could gain by putting a policy in place that describes, as Randall said, any reasonable interpretation of your job is valid. Don't drive your ministry in the ditch and get it stuck. Don't run over pedestrians on the sidewalk and do no damage when it comes to dealing with people. Don't leave a trail of dead spiritual bodies. In New Hope's life here, with a small intimate family that we have, we've come through several years where yours truly said, we'll go here, we'll go there, now we'll go over there. I pointed things out, talked to people, and we went that way. It would be my desire that we look at what we do and how we operate when it comes to our missional living, when it comes to our being missionaries in our own backyards. And when we care for each other, I would like to consider over a six-month period finding out, thinking, looking into, studying about team function and see if there are blessings we can enact here by becoming like Paul did and by becoming like what Jesus created, the group, the team, and be able to operate at a level where there's even more accountability. And when you have accountability, what does that produce? Could you say accountability produces accuracy in what you said you would do? You know, I stop and look at this, and I, I'm going to pick on Nancy here. <laughs> I'm back here making faces. <laughs> but I understood what those faces mean. You're thinking about what is this about? What is it really getting at? And my point is this. I could not get where I need to be without Nancy. She is the dogged Rottweiler that chases me around and nips at my heels to get her receipts. And when I don't, she doesn't hesitate to come up and nip me right in the butt. But it is that accountability that keeps me moving in the direction I should be going at. Here's what I'm thinking. The more you spread around the accountability, the more blaming that could happen. You know what I'm saying? I understand you're, what you're saying. I can't, I'm not, I can't be, like you started off with the, it's a team, we're a team, we, you know, I don't get all the blame because it's all of our fault. Yes. And now you're saying, what? I, I'm saying that we have a benefit because you're a Rottweiler who chases me around and you provide accountability, but we're not a team in that accountability. We're Nancy holding Rick accountable. What if there was three of us who talked about finances and the physical care of the church and following procedure? Everything would take three times if, as long. Well, one <laughs> might think that's true, but think of this. We come up with a solution, we write it down, we enact it, and if something doesn't go right, the team says, hey, can you come and explain this and tell us about it? The team model brings one thing to the table, more than one view of what reality is and what can be, but isn't yet. 
Nancy says things all the time that just amaze me, and I find myself thinking, how come I didn't know that? I never thought of that. Bill, frequently, these gems come out of his mouth, and I find myself looking at something in my mind's eye. How come I didn't know that? Why couldn't I have? Wow. And then it becomes <coughs> obvious. We're here in this collection of people because we have one of the most unique teams of people that exist in Grace Communion International right now. When we stop and look at who we are and where we want to be as Christians, I think the, the accountability factor is huge. It is one of the most important parts of being a Christian and being a person who has Christian responsibilities and someone who is both in a functional church and in a family. I think the ideas that set in team leadership are important and critical for New Hope going forward. I found it interesting that I got emails this week from CCLI about team leadership training for music and worship and praise and kids' church and everything, but it was about team leadership and training. Three or more people can register and go to this clinic, and you get this uh, psychological education that's put on by a psychologist, but it's about team. Well, GCI, it's about team. It's about team for summer camp. It's about team for uh, administration. There's always more than one or two people at the front office that do their jobs. But the accountability and the team leadership, Tim talked about that twice in the last six months. I heard both of them, but uh, I think Nancy got to hear one where Tim, uh, Tim alluded to the fact that when you have team, you have the greater sense of we the community of believers. And so I would ask us to consider this, to think about it, and once every couple of weeks, I want to be able to pop out the question, what has someone discovered that's new about team leadership and team function? So in the future as we go forward, think about that. See if there are nuggets. Now, I'm not going to... I'm not going to be the guy who says, let's see, I've asked him two weeks ago and four weeks ago and nobody answered me. I'm going to keep asking because I want us to think about this. Is there richness we're missing? Yes? I'm sorry. I still don't quite know what you're talking about. What is it you want us to think about? We are we always is function the, so much as a team. You think we should be more as a team? Well, I don't know. I rarely ever see you here, but I talk to you on the phone. Um, we don't all sit down at one time to talk about what we're going to teach and how we're going to teach. Uh, it tends to be figured out by uh, one or two people, but there's no team focus in that. Um, when so we you think would like that, to see more team than we have. I would like to see more team than we have. I guess I'm not going to be able to allude to it. i got to say it outright. I would hope that we would come to a place that the team leadership could meet and sit down and figure out what uh, something should look like, figure out the accountability tree, and then who's doing what, and then the team pass that instruction, and someone runs with it. Uh, I would love to have the team mentality to sit down at a table and look at where we came from with outreach and where we want to go and tear that apart and figure out what our next step is and what direction it is. And then upon the team coming up with that, we write it down and we send that mission off in that direction. 
Thank you. There, there's really... I hear what you're saying now. It, it, has anybody ever got to see Pastor Bill doing his administrative things? Me. I've not, I've not see seen it. it. Nancy has. <laughs> Diane, I don't think you've seen Pastor Bill doing that job, but yet it gets done because nobody's calling and yelling at Pastor Bill. Hey, you didn't do that. They're all calling and yelling at me. Because I didn't give Nancy receipts. But that's okay. The whole idea here is that we want to come together and we want to create a description on paper of how we function. If there's team leadership, the team can be described. Its attributes and functions can be described. But I would love to see what we're missing out on and what things are possible that we're not tapped into right now if we made decisions and executed those decisions and then gave responsibility to act on them if we did that under a truly team model. Where would that go? And you know, the bigger the church gets, the church starts looking at team for everything it does. There's still one person accountable at the top. But Jesus made a statement about team, and he made it clear the disciples were the ones that would have tasks after he departed, even though they didn't understand what that was. Jesus went from the I to the you, plural, you, you guys right there, the team of you. Paul operated with that. And I think it would be a blessing and a benefit, and I think it would also allow us to use what God has put here and what the Holy Spirit has driven into our arms to use. To use that more efficiently, I think we need to evaluate it. But Jesus prepared for and built team. Paul built team. There are stories of team in the New Testament. And I think that we can capitalize on something that we have not really thought about deeply. My thing, I want to move away from Rick said. I want to move towards. We evaluated this and we found this and this and we've decided now to do that with it. And that's the person who's in charge of it. But it's the we. You know, if we're really candid and honest with ourselves and truthful, when it comes to outreach, I'm pretty much the only person who knows what's happening and why it's happening. Got to talk to Mark to find out when it's happening. But when it comes to administrative stuff, Pastor Bill's doing that job. And that's awesome. But in my doing, in his doing, we're divergent. And the two aren't together directly. Yes? Oh, it'd be nice to have you together, but in, in your divergence, you're getting it all done. Everybody doesn't have to do everything. That is true. I mean, but, you know, that's a point of a team is you get a job. You know, like that lemon. Remember, he had us go through the lemon thing? You're yep. good at this. You're good at that. we got to get somebody who's good at that to be part of this team so we'll be rounded out. You know. And, and that is what I'm pointing at in a nutshell. We're rounded out or our needs are filled. There's someone in every chair. And we're able to go do that job now. But I, I think the communication during the decision-making processes and during the function of the church, I think looking at the benefits of team will take us to new places. I think it's important. The, the biggest benefit of what you're talking about, team meetings and whatnot, and that's something we haven't been able to do due to scheduling and all that kind of stuff, is that person A, B, and C know exactly what person B, C, and D are doing and why. By knowing that, when they're doing their thing, they go, oh, I know that Bill does this, so I need to do that to make his job easier, and I can go, oh yeah, so and so is doing that, so I can do this to make their job easier, and we know what's going on. Plus, if something happens to me, 
Rick will know exactly what I'm doing and he can fill in while I'm whatever. See, what we have now is if Rick gets really bad sick, we don't have a clue what's going on. She's learning. She's learning. <laughs> yes. But the point is, everybody should know so that anybody can step in. And that's the end result. That's the net effect of what we would hope to change. There's more unity. There's more knowledge spread out to one or two more people about each thing we do. But we wind up providing a safety net should something go wrong or happen. We wind up taking excellent care of each other and having each other's backs. So looking at this whole idea of team, let's talk about that over the next few months. What is it that is in team that we can take advantage of? What is it we should watch out for? And then sit down and figure out how to formulate that team leadership. You know, I've worked for one boss who ruled with an iron fist and he used words as though they were 50 caliber machine guns. And then I worked for another boss and he would not run the company. He mandated that his employees below him ran the company. And the difference was that the peace, the tranquility, the contentment was way up there for everybody because the owner pointed where he wanted to go and the team ran the company. The team ran 120 painters, 36 job superintendents, 80 carpenters, and even more plumbers. The team ran all those employees and there was not a time when someone did not know what was going on. And because it was planned by more than one person, you could always get your answer. It saved the company one time during a bad financial crisis because more than one person was aware. Bill, i got to tell you thank you for bringing that up and pointing that out because it is the crux of what I'm talking about. God wants us to be efficient. He wants us to be thorough. He wants us to be supportive of each other and do what we do in unity. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for who you've made us to be. Thank you for putting us together here in this family and having people that are dedicated and loyal to Jesus and who love what his mission is all about. We're grateful for that. I thank you for giving me manna each day, one day at a time, to do what you put me here to do. And I thank you for the people that are coming alongside to help. We thank you for everybody in our church family as a whole, the team. So in Jesus' name, we give you thanks, God, for your plan. And Jesus, we thank you for your participation and your ministry in your Father's plan. And Holy Spirit, thank you for blessing us with knowledge and drive and a desire to love and be complete and be full. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.